mercy and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We are in the midst of a sermon series and it's called Heart Issues Are Hard Issues. And you can see it's a series with that subtitle, Racial Healing in Our Church and for Our Community. You'll find in your sermon notes that today's theme is Jesus Breaks Down the Dividing Walls of Hostility. I love that scripture that we're going to focus on today because it's true. It's based on Ephesians 2, verse 14. And if you don't have the notes, uh, I'd like to encourage you, maybe even bother you, to get up and grab uh, a copy of those sermon notes. There's some over here, there's some in the back. And um, we'll just soak in God's true scriptures for us today. And if you're online, I would encourage you to get out your Bible and open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 2. And we're so glad you're joining us today. May God bless each of us as we gather around the word of Jesus, wherever we are. Oh, and also, for you online, I'm going to encourage you to share some encouraging words with each other. So uh, you can type, say whatever you want, but maybe right now if you want, you could say, I love my Bible. And let's all say that out loud right here. I love my Bible. So <clears throat> we gather. The reason we get together as believers is because Jesus is in the midst of us. And it's his word that changes us. So let's jump in. We got our notes. We got our Bibles. And Ephesians 2.13. We're going to start right there, our key verse. But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. And in this one body, and that is Christ's body, the church, he has reconciled both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near. Peace jumps out in this passage and that's what we need, that's what our, our world needs, not hostility. But that certainly is what we've seen an awful lot of. So Lord, help us be agents of peace using your word. The goal for this message today is to empower you, brothers and sisters, all of us here at Emmanuel, to truly believe that Jesus is the only one who can solve the division and racial tension. He is the answer to all the problems that our society has been currently experiencing. Do you really believe that though? We sometimes talk a good talk. But do we really believe that Jesus is the only solution? My hope also is to inspire you to go and be Christ's church, wherever he has put you to shine your light, and to apply his gospel, his good news, that will break down the dividing walls of hostility that we see in many arenas of our society. God wants you to be his hands and feet he wants you to be his voice to bring that peace that the world cannot give. Let me make one important side note right now, and that's something I think we can all agree on, that there is no other power in this entire world under heaven that can solve the racial tension and all the problems that we're seeing in our world today. There is none including all the politicians on both sides of the aisle, all the political parties, whether here or in some foreign land, 
there is no other power that can solve what we are facing. So thanks be to God, though, we know Jesus, and Jesus gives us gospel power. That's what we're going to focus on today. Let's ask clearly, and that's what this sermon series is doing, what are we Christians to do when we see this racial tension? How do we address it? Firstly, let me say this, don't moan and don't complain about it. And don't wait around for someone else to solve it. I think we sometimes are guilty of doing that. We do know, and I believe we all agree that Jesus is the answer. So we need to go and be the church. Not just here while we worship or go to Bible class, but we need to go and be the church. God said this, do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God, without fault, in a warped and crooked generation. We are living in a warped and crooked world. Then, God says, you will shine like stars among them as you hold out the word of life. Philippians 2, 14 to 16. Now, if you're online, I'm just gonna encourage you again, maybe nudge you again to encourage each other. Maybe type something like shine or shine like stars or hold out the word of life, which we're learning how to do right now. Just whatever you might think of on your heart. Encourage each other. We want to be a church community here. We can see each other face to face, but wherever we are, touching and interacting with God's word. It's the glue that binds us together. And it is the thing and the only thing that will dissolve racial tension. The power of God's word, his word of life, brings healing and it brings hope. One practical takeaway from this message that I want to mention now and then I will again later is first of all to pray. We heard the Lord's Prayer again. We're going to look specifically at that at the end of the message. But while you pray, pray with purpose. Pray that God will give you someone to go love on. And I want to specifically encourage you to pray that God would give you someone of another ethnic background that you can befriend and that you can love on and that we can be the church that tears down those walls. Some may say, what can I do? When we say that, I do believe that we underestimate the power of one cross-cultural relationship to change the world. A relationship that is built on Jesus' love, built on Jesus' word of life, and built on a long-term commitment to tear down the walls, that we have the power to tear down. You and I and our church, I know it's true, one friendship at a time can change families, change workplaces, change our communities, change our state, change our country, point it on a new path, and yes, change our world. When you look at the Gospels and you read the book of Acts, you see time and time again where Jesus steps across ethnic boundaries and he does things that most people raise their eyebrows at. Like, what are you doing? Wait, you want us to go through Samaria? And Jesus would do that often. His disciples learned well. And so you see Paul and Peter doing the same thing all through the book of Acts and all of the disciples. They ran right into this topic of race and ethnicity. And when they saw division, Jesus and his disciples were always there to proactively bring unity because that's what Jesus does. 
Jesus makes us brothers and sisters. That is a tight family bond. And if you meet a believer from a faraway foreign land, you have a closer connection with them, even if you don't eat the same food or have the same culture or speak the same language, than you do with someone who was born and raised on the same street as you, might have even gone to the same school, but they don't follow Jesus. There's not much of a connection there in the long run. Now, I would say that there's a lot of scoffers out there. There always has been back when Peter wrote it in his epistle till this day that scoff at the church. And one of the things they scoff at is to say that we're powerless to fix the problems in society. We're powerless to really address racial tension. So they would just say, be quiet. Church, you have nothing to contribute. But I'd say in rebuttal, that Jesus and Jesus' words are all that we need to resolve and heal what's going on today. And I will tell you that it is happening. This isn't just a pipe dream or something on a wish list. This really is happening wherever believers in Jesus apply his words. And in a moment, I'm gonna share some beautiful stories of that actually happening. And we can also rejoice that it's happening right here in this church that is alive and well and Jesus is in the center of it. And it will continue to happen until Jesus comes back. But first, let's look at Jesus' words. For Jesus and his word is the foundation, the catalyst for all real change. Simply, we'll look at these three, pretty familiar Number one, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Is this not a recipe for getting rid of racial tension and divisions? Number two, do to others as you would have them do to you. Again, I can't think of a better word from the God who made all people on how to get rid of the dividing walls of hostility. Number three, love your enemies and pray for them that you may be children of your Father in heaven. Let's remember that love is action. It's not a feeling. And Jesus, in saying these words, has told us to get busy, to act. Love is action. I could right now perhaps end the sermon right here and simply proclaim, now let's just go do it. And I would be following in Jesus' steps because he ended one of his sermons when he told this one parable. And at the very end, he said, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like the wise man who built his house upon the rock. Jesus and his words are all that's needed. And faithful followers who believe Jesus and say, Jesus, work through me, reign in my heart, and live your life through me. And we'll see Jesus do miracles today. Sadly, though, Jesus and his words are what the world and the woke movement are completely missing. You won't hear Jesus. You won't hear Jesus' teachings anytime you look at these worldly movements. If man simply put Jesus' words into practice, we know that racial tension would be eliminated. And we would see real peace and healing happen. But sadly, what we do see is the world and various movements not putting Jesus forward, and therefore just the opposite happens. And what just the opposite is, is massive walls of division and more hatred and hostility, which God wants to get rid of. Lord, help us. Now, if you're a confirmation student out there, and I know one of your homework assignments is to take notes on sermons, and if you're looking for the law, because every message has law and gospel, the law shows our sin and the gospel shows our Savior, well, what I've been talking about is the law. We could say the law right here is follow Jesus' teaching and put it into practice and things will go well. Don't follow Jesus' teaching 
and things will go horribly in our personal lives and in our world. The reason the world is messed up, the reason we have so much racial tension is because it doesn't follow Jesus. And here we gotta be honest, and hopefully we always will be, but especially before we sit at Jesus' feet, we have to be honest about the fact that even we, his followers, so often don't put Jesus' words into practice. Instead of loving our neighbors who are culturally and ethnically different than we are, we have avoided them. We've looked down on them. Maybe we've judged them or been fearful of them. Like they're just too different and the chasm is too wide for me to cross over. Maybe we've just been guilty of not taking time to try to get to know them and build a friendship. Yes, we have all failed miserably in doing what Jesus taught us to do. And here's the reality. To the extent that we haven't practiced Jesus' words, we are each responsible. Yes, we right here are responsible for the racial tension and division that plagues our city, our country, and our world. We do have a part in it. We're guilty, and we, yes, according to the law, deserve punishment. And so all we can do is pray. Lord, have mercy. Lord, change me. Lord, use me. And create in me a clean heart, a new heart that loves people the way you did when you walked up to that Samaritan woman who was as different as could be and you loved her. And she came to faith and she ran into town and led the whole Samaritan village to Jesus. That's what crossing cultural boundaries can look like. So please take that loving rebuke to heart. Repent wherever the Holy Spirit shows you you need to. But don't despair. Don't ever despair. Rather, I encourage you to look up and look at Jesus because he's here and he wants to build us up today, not tear us down. We don't come to church to just be reminded of our sin. We come to church to learn the best way, the Jesus way that he wants to lead us on. God forgives and he is still at work in you and me. He's at work right here at Emmanuel because we're committed to him and his word. And where we've blown it, we're gonna repent and we're gonna improve with the Holy Spirit's power. God never gives up on you. And here's what I'm excited to share. As you see in your notes, we're gonna look at a few success stories and there's more than just a few. I know that there's thousands or tens of thousands, but we don't have time to recount them all, of what the church is doing, speaking the truth in love, breaking down racial tension. So after we look at a couple stories, we'll end with a couple motivating scriptures that will spur us on to love in action. The first story I'd like to share is about this church down in Tennessee called All Saints. It's actually an Episcopal church. And the pastor, Michael Spurlock, was sent by his bishop, they have bishops in the Episcopal church, to do this difficult mission. He had to go and close the church down. That was his mission. How would you like that job? Hey, I'm here, I'm your new pastor. We're gonna close our doors. And the reason is they had dwindled down to 12 white members, despite the fact that they had a three-quarter million dollar debt. And the church, at least in the Episcopal church, thankfully not in our church, they own everything. So the church said, we need to liquidate that because it's never going to get prosperous and above uh, in the black. So Pastor Spurlock had a challenge. But instead of closing down the church, he was a rebel. Well, actually, God helped him to be a rebel. And he set out on a wonderful new mission he wasn't intending to, but God has plans that are way ahead of ours. And because of what God did, Pastor Spurlock met up with these Burmese refugees called the Kareni people. 
from Eastern Burma. This true story of how God's grace brought two very different ethnic groups together was made into an amazing movie called All Saints. It was released back in August of 2017. Maybe you saw it. I will say it's probably on my top 10 list of maybe all movies, but for sure Christian-based movies. It's really inspiring, and it, it made me cry more than once. It was a tearjerker because I was crying for joy. If you're looking for some great entertainment, I highly recommend it. Without ruining it for you, though, the beauty of this story is that only when the Kareni immigrants surprisingly showed up for church one Sunday, because some of them had a Christian background, did the church begin to thrive. God moved Pastor Spurlock and those handful of members to actually welcome them. And then God inspired the pastor with this plan to save the church by having the refugees farm the land because they were blessed with many, many acres of good land right around the church. It was obvious that the church had unused land and it was obvious that now they had lots of good workers for these Kareni were expert farmers. The Kareni were very poor. They were new immigrants. Many of them still didn't have jobs. So they needed food for their families and the church needed money to pay its bills. And so Pastor Spurlock said, God just had me do the math. More than helping to pay the bills though, and put food on the tables of the immigrants. The endeavor led the church to become a thriving, multi-ethnic community. And they are still open today and still joyfully worshiping Jesus and serving their community and their world. I think the amazing irony of this movie can be summarized by asking one simple question, but it's pretty deep. Who, who saved whom or who helped whom I guess you could say saved because the pastor in the movie did say that God gave me a plan to save the church in a real way God sent these immigrants and the history of all saints was completely changed on the other hand their lives were drastically improved because of the church as we think about that question, let's ponder it a little bit more and think about the typical American attitude. Now, if you go around the world, you might hear the phrase, the ugly American. And that comes from the idea that we're pretty ethnocentric. Ethnocentric means we think we're the center of the world. It goes along hand in hand with pride. Now, I'm not here to criticize Americans. I'm one proud American. You'll find ethnocentrism wherever you go in the world. I lived in China, I've lived in Thailand, I've visited a variety of countries over there, and they all think they're the best. In fact, China, the way they make their world map, China is the center, and America's falling off the side over here. If you see an American map, well, we're in the center. Now, if you want to know the Chinese character, this is very ethnocentric. It's a square with a line through the middle. That means China because it's the world and we're the center of it. Well, ethnocentrism is kind of a sinful thing and it manifests itself also in the church. The American church has been caught up in this false, misleading mindset that grudgingly says, it is our duty to help our poor neighbors over here instead of viewing them as God-sent blessings. As we look at it, there's a lot of reasons, not just one, it's complex, but the church has failed, oftentimes, to help or respond to the needs of people living in our surrounding communities, especially those that don't look like us. Sadly, God-given opportunities and the life-changing truth is missed that these poor neighbors have been placed right on the doorsteps of American churches in order to help us, in order to bless us. 
Yes, even bless the blind, haughty, material, materially rich American church that is at times spiritually poor. Now, I'm not just exaggerating. Those are the words God chose to describe at least some churches, like the one in Revelation 3 called the Laodicean church. Many in the church, sadly, would view multi-ethnic ministry that seeks to serve our African, our Hispanic, our Asian, or whatever ethnic group they come from, neighbors. And they would say, rather, oh, that's just a drain on the church. Now that's an inward-looking mindset, but God always wants us to look outward. If you've looked at the LCMS cross, I love it. If you haven't seen it lately, it's called the cross in action. And if you look at it carefully, it's moving. The designer or the artist made it that way because we're supposed to be going on a mission always, not looking inward. Yes, these poor neighbors that we sometimes view with skepticism are actually a huge blessing. They are priceless people for whom Christ died and they are an incredible untapped resource of the church that will bring untold kingdom blessings. If only the church will welcome them by stepping out of its comfort zone and working with Christ in faith. I would say even though it's difficult, kind of like Pilgrim's Progress, that's a long, tough journey, not an easy one, it is definitely worth it. The time it takes to build any friendship is worth it. We'd all agree to that. But I think there's special rewards when we cross the chasm of cultural boundaries and get to know others and help them know Jesus. As for all saints, no doubt, it was a huge blessing when these Kareni just came to church one day. And the church has had an amazing rebirth. And it did not close. The second story is a little shorter. It's about a fellow, a sister, LCMS Church down in Georgia. This church is a medium-sized church. It's right in the middle of Georgia. It's English-speaking, predominantly white. And yet, God led Mount Calvary to also meet up with, surprisingly, a bunch of Burmese refugees who had also come to Georgia. I've read that 90,000 Burmese refugees are now spread out around America, while another 200,000 sit in UN refugee camps, stuck in no man's land between Thailand that doesn't want them and Burma that doesn't want them. The only problem is the Burmese army tries to shoot them and kill them, and so they're stuck in these little UN camps with bags of rice and bamboo poles. And most of the refugees that we met in middle Georgia spent 20 or more years in these UN camps. Well, needless to say, they were pretty excited when Mount Calvary opened its doors and gave them some worship space in this youth room. And they started meeting there. And this guy in red, I just gotta mention real quick, his name is Glenn, and I am so thankful for that brother in Christ. He and his wife Pam love these people like unbelievable. They have time for them any time of the day. They've helped them with any need that you can imagine from building homes to helping them get driver's licenses to figuring out how to read the bill that they're supposed to pay to going up and helping them take their oath and become new U.S. immigrants. But the most important thing they do is, well, they share the love of Christ and they open the word to these Burmese immigrants. In short, Mount Calvary took a risk, stepped out in faith, they opened their doors, they opened their hearts, they had a lot of good food, good discoveries. They even learned a few Kareni words and it is a very strange language. This is one of the slides because we had these multi-ethnic worship services where we'd have English on one slide, uh, one screen, and Kareni on the other. And it was a real joy that in the summer of 2017, we had six 
combined worship services to try to bring the two worshiping communities together. There's Pastor Brighton giving a message with a great translator, Tame, and they heard the word translated one line at a time. One last pretty cool detail is after these worship services happened, the movie All Saints came out. And so I just want you to catch this. We have a really big God. And God was doing one thing in Georgia and doing a very similar thing up in Tennessee. But he's the same God who is bringing the good news of Jesus to all peoples. And so at the end of that summer, a bunch of us got to watch the movie All Saints and had a great time. Here at Emmanuel, we have an amazing story that's happening and for 160 years it's been happening and we have an exciting future because this same Jesus who has told us to go to the ends of the earth to love those in our Jerusalem which is Grand Rapids to love those in our Judea which is the greater state of Michigan to love those in our Samaria which might be the next closest country maybe that's Ohio uh, or Canada or Mexico and even to love people to the ends of the earth he is still here leading us day by day and we get to intersect with all kinds of people and every time we do it's a new adventure and many of them are from far away places which is really exciting because God has brought Grand Rapids to be an international crossroads if you haven't noticed just open your eyes and you can't miss people from all over my wife and I were just at a coffee shop and we saw one lady from Asia walk in and we saw another guy from India walk in and I'm pretty sure they were both exchange students amazing what's going on in this city well let me close with this thought about an important doctrine it's called the doctrine of the atonement and the doctrine of the atonement is where Jesus has covered over all of our sins atonement means to cover and Jesus covered our sins at the cross and when he removed our sins as far as the east is from the west God the Father no longer looks at you or me as guilty miserable sinners Jesus has taken it all and because of what Jesus did on the cross we take that word atonement and you can see in that word, at one meant. God in Christ has made us at one with him. He has removed the dividing wall of our sin that separated us from his holiness. That happened at the cross. And when you look at the cross, this vertical beam tells you that, thank you, Jesus. He's done it all. There's no dividing wall of hostility anymore between you and the Father. And our Ephesians passage says that we have direct access to the Father because of Jesus. We are at one. But it doesn't stop there in Ephesians. If you read the whole chapter, the first half is about how God has made us at one with him. The second half of the chapter, which we focused on on our reading for today, is like the vertical beam of the cross. And it clearly talks about how God has made us at one with all other people. They're not our enemies. We'll never hate them. God indeed has forgiven their sins as much as he's forgiven ours. And he has made it possible for the dividing walls of hostility to be completely gone so that we can be at one with every other person in the whole world. Thank God that we have this mission, that we get to share the good news. As we conclude, I want to share just a thought from Isaiah 49. Old Testament and New Testament, we have the same God. Isaiah 49, we heard it already. It said, you're to be a light to the Gentiles. Gentile would be the ethne, the ethne, to the ends of the earth, all the ethne doesn't matter what ethnic group they are. You're to be a light to all the ethnic groups. That's your mission. That's our mission here at Emmanuel. 
to shine Jesus' light and connect people and make them at one with Jesus and to make them at one with each other. I'll leave you with this beautiful picture from Scripture. Maybe one of the most beautiful about heaven. And we just take a moment and ponder heaven right now. We're going to heaven. Jesus has given us the free gift of heaven. He did everything needed on the cross and given us a free ticket to go to heaven. There's no doubt about that. Your sins are paid for. The gift is yours. Ponder what's going on in heaven according to Revelation chapter 7. This passage is so beautiful. And catch as I read it how this passage shows the church made up of all ethna, all ethnic groups. John writes, as God gave him a clear view of heaven, after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. What a beautiful picture. I can't wait to be there. We're gonna gather around Jesus. He's gonna be the center and we get to worship him. Now that's not all we get to do. It does say we're gonna plant vineyards, we're gonna build houses, we're gonna eat big feasts with real food. If you remember, Jesus ate a fish after his resurrection from the dead. And he said, you're gonna have a resurrection body like mine, so we're gonna eat and we're gonna drink good wine. But we're gonna spend a lot of time around the throne. And let me just say, we learned that prayer and you've prayed it probably a few thousand times in your life about hallowed be thy name. Praise be to Jesus. We get to praise him now, but we're gonna praise him for eternity. And then we, we, we learn in that prayer one more thing, and I want you to understand this. We pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, how is his will being done in heaven? It's people from every tribe, language, nation gathered around Jesus. So if that's happening and will happen for eternity, let's set out and make it happen more this side of heaven. Because we pray your will be done here as it is in heaven. Thank you, God, that we can be part of that. And I'll leave you with this final blessing. May the Lord give you his peace. Peace shows up three times in our epistle lesson. May he give you his peace so that you can spread his peace, never hostility, to all people. And may you share his goodwill, that is love in action, with all the people that you'll ever meet. And don't forget, pray. First of all, pray. Have opportunity eyes and go find someone to love on. Lord willing, someone from another ethnic so that we can have more brothers and sisters gathered around the throne. To God be the glory, amen.